Hi everyone, good morning. I am so happy to see you all, to share with you my love of Eretz Yisrael. Today we're going to speak about a place that I've never spoken about before. Um, I love it. I hope to give you new ideas where to go and to make your love grow even more, <laughs> as I know mine always does. So I'm going to start out with a story and then we'll get into the place, what we're talking about, our goals for the next 35 minutes. So in the late 1880s, there was a group of people that they were promised this magical land. They were promised that they would get to this land and they would hold their hand out and the fruit would just fall into their hands. And if they would bend down to the ground, they'd bend down and scoop up honey. And this group of people, about a hundred families that left their homes in Romania, got to the land, expected to see these kind of things and saw nothing of the sort. So I will now, with that introduction, I would like to share my screen with you. Okay. Today we are going to be speaking about a town in Israel called Vichron Yaakov. And I found this picture online, which I really, really loved. It's a little bit blurry, but the idea is clear. It says the land of milk and honey. And we see here a bottle of milk with a spout showing how easy it is. You want milk, you just open the spout. And we see here a picture of honey, um, meaning it's so easy to get honey. And <coughs> the group that I described a minute ago that was told they would come to the land of Israel, and this is what they would find, this is what they really expected to find. And I just want to comment for a minute. I know um, when you learn in school, the land of milk and honey, milk is comes from the animals and honey uh, this picture, they even show bees. However, very important to know that this is a side point. When Edith Cell talks about honey as um, edit, uh, and as one of the sh seven species, it's not talking about bee honey. It's talking about honey from dates. And I know I never even really knew what it was until I moved here. And now I cook with it all the time. Um, so silan is date honey. So when it's talking about the land of milk and honey, it's referring to honey from fruits. Anyway. Um, this is what the people from Romania expected to find. And we're talking about the year 1882. And this was very, very far from their expectations. And one of the questions I want to focus on today is what happens when reality is so far away from expectations? You expect one thing and then the reality is another. And I don't even think of this now, but as I'm reading this question, I'm literally thinking of what I'm going through right now in my life. And how God willing I'm getting married soon and what I expect my wedding to be and what I want and then what reality is and I think for all of us um, to be able to know when we can advance what's going to happen and then for it not so I think this question which I'm going to talk about in the context of the late 1800s when people expected one thing and got another I think it's definitely very connected to nowadays so the focus questions are going to be what was it like for Olim during the Aliyah Shona time period one of my hobbies as an Ola myself, I moved to Israel a little bit over four years ago, probably four and a half at this point. I love asking people why they made Aliyah. Why did you move to Israel? How is it when you moved? And even if they're Israeli, I always ask them who in their family moved. There are families that could count back eight generations, but most people <coughs> you meet on the street, they their grandma moved, their grandpa moved, and it always fascinates me. Now, there's a, this, if uh, you follow history, there's this time period called the Aliyah Rishona, the first Aliyah from 1882 to 1904. Now, the name always bothered me because who is deciding that that's the first Aliyah? Really, the first Ole is Abraham Avino. He was the first one to move to Israel. And throughout Jewish history, there was always people moving. So who decides that this group is the first? But th this is, it's important to recognize that this is what, the group of Jews, we're going to talk about who and how many in a minute who moved to Israel during that time period is considered Aliyah Rishona and possibly because the impact that they made in terms of building the land was really very significant. So that's question number one. Question number two, who was the Baron Rothschild? So some of you might have heard his name. Um, in Israel, there's tons of streets named after him and it's just a name that you hear all the time for a very good reason. And the third question is must see places in Zechron Yaakov. Um, if you've never gone there, or even if you have gone there, you could spend an entire day there. If you need an idea for your itinerary for your trip, you could spend the whole day there. It's beautiful, it's fun, it's meaningful. Where is it? So, as always, I like starting with the map. 
We have Jerusalem down at the bottom. You drive about an hour and a half, you get to Zichron Yaakov. It's all the way up north. It's a little bit under Haifa. Um, it's a drive. So I, I don't know that I'd do it. You can do it in one day, but maybe it's better if you're staying somewhere closer. Now, what was the difficult reality? So 60 families, they plan on coming to Zichron Yaakov, which wasn't called that at the time. It was called a town named Zamarin. And they make their way to Eretz Yisrael. Now, I want to point out something which just shows how much history really repeats itself. In, in the late 1880s, there was this mass wave of Jewish people leaving Europe because there were pogroms there and they were facing anti-Semitism. Two million Jews went to America. How many Jews went to Eretz Yisrael? About 40,000 Jews went to Eretz Yisrael. And a lot of Jews went to the, the, the four holy cities. That's really where they were concentrated. Tzvat, Tveria, Chavnon, and Yerushalayim. And now we have Jews that are starting something new. And they get to Haifa, because that's where the port is and they need farm tools. Now they came planning to be farmers and what an honor to get to farm the land of Eretz Yisrael. So they buy wagons and uh, tools to farm the land and they're expecting that the topography one is gonna be like they expected. Now they weren't expecting this because they were just driving blindly. blindly. There was actually a group of people, they nicknamed them the spies that went to Israel to check out the land to see what it was and if it was a, a piece of land that should be purchased. And they came back and said, it's amazing, we swear. It's kind of opposite the way the original Meraglim in the Torah were, that they saw Eretz Yisrael and gave such a bad report. So anyway, the, the Jews of Romania, they come expecting to find something. And if you see this picture, you notice how rocky the land is. And the tools that they had with them that they bought in Haifa were not sufficient. They couldn't farm the land. There were too many rocks and they couldn't even bring their wagons because the wagons wouldn't go on the rocky land. So right away, they see that what they expected is not what um, is the truth. And um, a lot of the issues that they dealt with, they were, there was real hunger. A lot of time, like now, if there's enough, if I can't, if I don't like what's in my house to eat, I'll say I'm starving. Not really starving, but the people literally were starving and they're, um, also, infant mortality rate was very high. It was just very, very difficult. And they did not know how they're going to get out of this difficult predicament because at the end of the day, it's all nice and dandy. You love Eretz Yisrael. You want to be here. You connect to the land. But if you are dying of starvation, you're dying of starvation and you need food at the end of the day and they're coming and they have these great dreams, but it's just not working for them. Along comes a man named the Baron Hirsch, and he, what he, he, one of his representatives, he, he was a philanthropist from France, very rich Joe. He comes, he sends a representative to the Jews, and he tells them, look, I see you guys have terrible lives here, hungry, dying, starving, you don't know how to work the land. And it, it reminds me of, in, in parentheses, I have a garden in, um, right outside my apartment in Jerusalem, I have a garden. My roommates and I, we tend to it. We don't know how to garden. We take the seeds, stick it in the soil, pour water and hope it works. But okay, we're, we don't really plan on eating from it. And if it works, it works. If not, it's not, it's flowers. But to really come to a land and expect food to come out of it and to really not know how, it doesn't just work. So anyway, the uh, Baron Hirsch comes to them and he tells them, I'm going to help you. Here's the two options. I will give you a free ticket back to Romania, or I will help you move to Argentina. Why Argentina? An organization that, that this man had was called the JCA. He, um, one of the things he believed in was helping Jewish people and helping the Jews of Europe specifically who were dealing with anti-Semitism. And he had this idea, let's move the Jews to Argentina. So that's what he told them. And I wanna share with you now, there, it could very well be that there were Jews that said, great, finally, I have an out of this hard life. And it's very legitimate for people to say that. But I want to share with you an amazing answer that one of the pioneers gave. And I also want to add, a lot of times when we think of Eretz Yisrael being built up, the picture we have in our mind is these chiloni, non-religious, young people working the land, kibbutzim. All that is true, but later on. Right now, the people that are here are families, they're religious, and they're trying to make it work. So
So the quote is in Hebrew. I didn't translate it, but I'm going to translate for you. So one of the people responded. He said, We came to the land of our fathers for a holy goal. We have no other house in the entire world. We're going to live here and we're going to die here. In other words, how could you suggest that we leave Eretz Yisrael? This is our home. We can't leave our home. We are going to stay here for the rest of our lives. We're going to just make it work. Now, this is a beautiful answer, but the Jews are still stuck. They're dying of starvation, of sickness. What are they going to do? They don't know where to turn to. They don't have a lot of money. One of the things they thought was the Jews in, in Romania and in Europe that did not move to Eretz Yisrael, they had organizations with money to come and help the Jews. And that there were a ton, there were Zionists and people that they weren't going to move themselves. So they would support people, which is also similar to what happens now. There's people that don't live in NFC cell and they want to support the people that do. But what happens in hard times, if it's hard usually for one group of people, it's hard for another group of people. It's hard for the Jews in NFC cell. It's hard for the Jews in Europe and the money wasn't coming anymore. So they're stuck. Now that we all agree they're stuck, what are they going to do? So now, the, so they're still in the same predicament of not knowing where to turn, not knowing what to do, but determined that they want to stay. And then along comes this, when uh, in Israel, there's this, when people talk about Habaron Rothschild, this is who they're talking about, even though they both have the same names. Um, and he, so Edmund Rothschild, he was also from France, very, very rich from a banking family. Now, ironically, he was not interested in banking. He was interested in science and art and his nicknames, you see I wrote on the side, he was known as Avi Hayishov, the father of the settlements or Hanadiv Hayadua, the known generous person. In the beginning, it was anonymous. No one really knew where the money was coming from. And he literally single-handedly saved these Jewish people and the communities. This was not the only community he saved. He saved many more. And what he decided is, I want to take my money and I want to invest it in Eretz Yisrael and I want to help the people living there and I want it to work. Now, in order to make it work, he said, let me look at the problem. And I think also a lot of time, it's probably characteristic of businessmen. They're in business, they're in business and he's from a successful banking family for a reason. He looks at the situation that Jews are in and he said, how can we make it work? What's one of their issues? They don't know how to farm. So what does he do? He sends a group of people, they were called his pekidim, his officers, who are cultured, um, educated people from France who have the skills to farm, who know what they're doing. And he says, I'm going to send them to Eretz Yisrael and they are going to help the Jews farm. They're going to teach them what to do because if the Jews know, don't know what to do and my people do, they'll help them. So <coughs> it's a really great idea. And the, except there's a lot, a lot of tension that these people from France that are rich and educated, one, if you look at the picture, it says Bet Kidot, and you can actually visit this house today when you go to Zichron Yaakov. Later on, we're gonna talk about what's there today. First, I wanna give you the, the backstory. So you see it's two floors, there's beautiful windows, there's a balcony. This is now what the Jews lived in. Um, they were lucky if they even had house of stones. Eventually they built themselves house of stones, but beforehand they lived in huts and then uh, built it from wood. Except for the officers, they're living in this house. And the people of the time, they even nicknamed, nicknamed them Bneha Elohim, the sons of God. And they, their relationship with the people in Zechron Yaakov and in other Yishuvim that had similar stories was not one of humility. Why don't we try it this way? Let me teach you. It was, I know what to do and you need to listen to me. And another reason that, that um, uh, Rothschild wanted these officers here, other than to help them with farming, is because he was giving them a lot of money. He wanted to see his money managed and to make sure that his money was being used properly. But the relationship was not good. And there was a lot of tension and the farmers hated them because they hated people telling them what to do and thinking they were so much better. They see these families, you're poor and uneducated and we're rich and French. And even the, the officers, they got involved in way more than just farming. I mentioned earlier that the Zechron Yaakov was made of religious families. And one of an important religious institution is a shul. So of course there was a shul. And now these officers are even getting involved in the shul and saying, 
this is how we have to do it. We want to do it this way. We want to do it that way. And there's a whole list of things that the officers said that the people didn't want to follow. And the, the people rebelled against them. But on the one hand, they, they rebel. But on the other hand, they know that if, if uh, the Baron Rothschild gets angry, he's going to stop giving the money. If he stops giving the money, that's it. They're out. So that was the situation. Now, I want to show you today what it looks like. So you see how beautiful it is. Um, there is a fantastic, fantastic, fantastic museum called the First Aliyah Museum, which talks about what I'm telling you. Um, there, there's different rooms and you're following this family and different videos. This house, Betab Kidot, which belonged to the officers, the two story house, now they turned it into a museum. Uh, I'm gonna talk about it again later. It's amazing to see. Now, what was the end story? So eventually, um, the Baron Rothschild realized that this method of him sending people from France to oversee the farming and to teach wasn't really working because it was just a lot of opposition. And in the end, what he decided to do, which connects back to something you mentioned earlier, as he said, I'm going to step back a little bit and I'm going to take my money and I'm going to give it to the Baron Hirsch's organization, the JCA, which at this point was helping Jews in Israel. And he said, you know what, another uh, downside I see to these officers is if I want the communities to be independent, and that's what he wanted. He didn't want them to be dependent on him. The whole reason why he sent the farmer, the, the officers, is so they could help them farm and, and make money. He said, maybe I should just stop them altogether because I don't want them to be dependent on me. And that was how it stopped um, with these officers. One of the things that they planted, and this is important for what we're going to see later on, is the officers came and they planted vineyards. And in Zechron Yaakov, if, if any of you here listening likes wine, they have amazing wineries. And there's a very famous restaurant, which I'm going to mention later on, the Tishbi Winery, that a lot of people go and eat by. And the reason why today we could sit and enjoy these restaurants and wineries is because of the foresight of Baron Rothschild, who had the vineyards planted then. So um, I want to talk about now another aspect, the relationship of the Jews of Zichron Yaakov with the local Arabs, because oftentimes there are Arabs there, and what's the relationship? And I love talking about this aspect because it gives me a lot of hope. The town originally is named Zamarin. If you notice in the picture, there's a man and he's playing the flute. So Zamarin comes from an Arabic word, which means flute. And the Arabs there, they were shepherds and they were taking care of their crops and the Jews kept the name. Eventually it was renamed Zichron Yaakov because the Baron Rothschild's father was James, who was Yaakov, so he named the town after him. So first of all, the fact that the Jews are keeping the same name, uh, name shows something. Another thing I want to share. Notice this picture. I'm not sure the exact year it was taken. Um, I think around 1920s maybe. You see Jewish people. And you see Arabs. The, the town of Zichron Yaakov was a model town in terms of relationship between the Jews and the Arabs. And in a lot of pictures of the town from different years, you always see Arabs and Jews because they were part of each other's lives and they helped one another. And when I say helped one another, if we go back to the picture we saw at first of the rocks and it was very hard to work the ground. First of all, uh, an animal that actually was successful in this area was a camel because the camel could carry heavy loads. And they, the Arabs knew how to tame camels and the Jews didn't know. And another thing, which is really nice, there are people that have diaries about what it was like being there. And someone writes in his diary that they get there to Zamarin and they see the Arabs going out to the field and picking grass. And they thought, how sad is that? They need to eat grass. This is what they're eating. And later on, what happened? The Jews ran out, the Jews ran out of food. And they realize the Arabs aren't picking grass because they have nothing else to eat. They know how to take advantage of what grows around us and use it as food. And they, they used it as food as well. And the Arabs taught them how to get it and use it as food. And a lot of the Jews, um, second generation especially, learned how to speak Arabic. And there was really a beautiful relationship between Arabs and the Jews. And I love hearing about this because it really does give hope that in the country of Israel, it doesn't have to be Jews, Arabs, no one talks to each other. We, it really could be peace and, and mutual understanding and help. That, that's the way it was um, in Zechron Yaakov. Now, I'm not saying it was always like that and it was never looting, but for the most part, it was a nice relationship. Now I'd like to get to the parts of 
what is there to do in Zichron Yaakov? So first of all, the story in itself, I, one of the things that I love about Israel is you go to different places and they all have different stories. And if you connect to the history of the place, it really leaves you with a question to think about. And what did the people go through? How is that similar to my life? So other than all these great ideas, um, there's fun stuff to do. Now you might want lunch or dinner <laughs> and Israel has no shortage of great food. So you can go to the Tishvi winery. This is just one of five or three or five that are in Zechron Yaakov. And this was founded because they planted vineyards back then in 1882. Another thing, so this I mentioned, the first Eliyah Museum, which is a great museum because you're not going and looking at things behind glass, you're hear, hearing the story. And I really I always cry from Eliyah stories because it's just so beautiful how it was so hard for the people. And you see in the movie how one of the, the babies in the family dies and, and the, the, the family is so frustrated that there's no food and they don't know what to do. And it's real, real, real struggles. So keep the struggle in mind because it's going to connect to today. So also fantastic fun museum. It's also always good to know things to do when it's raining because if you come in January, it might rain. So this is indoors, totally great idea. Another option, there is a beautiful shul called Bet Knesset Ohel Yaakov, which at the time was known as one of the nice shuls in Israel and the Baron Rothschild came and visited it. It was, it's, you can still go and visit it today. It's still active, which I think is amazing how you have something from, from that long ago. And it's not just, oh, let's go look at how people used to pray. You could still, you could go and pray. You could see, you know, list it on the door, Shachari time and Chat times. And this is what it looks like inside. Another thing, this is a really nice fun fact. If anyone ever asks you, hey, do you happen to know? where the first garden of trees in Israel was planted, not for fruit, only for beauty? The answer is Zechron Yaakov. Zechron Yaakov has the record of just that. You see this beautiful garden with trees planted. Now, none of these trees are fruit trees. And back then they'd say, why are we planting fruit trees? Why are we planting trees for beauty? What a waste, let's plant fruit trees, which does have its merit. But here, one of the officers of Baron uh, Rothschild, he, I keep switching off between the Hebrew and English. I'm used to hearing it in Hebrew when I took the tour guiding course. I only had it in Hebrew, so it's like, anyway. Um, they, he decided he wants to plant a garden just for beauty. And the garden was the pride and joy of the people of Zechron Yaakov. And you can go there today and visit. Think of how nice you could sit on the bench, have, have lunch there, have a snack, just relax in the sun, talk to your family. And you see that this is beautiful pond and you see the lilies on it. Um, at some point, it might even still, I don't, I don't think it still has fish, but it had fish at some point. And it's when I learned about this and that the garden was planted just for beauty, I asked myself, what part does beauty have in my life? Because beauty really is an important aspect and it's good for your soul, which is why I'm super grateful for living in Israel. Because when I see the mountains and the trees and the flowers, it just does good for my soul. But even on a smaller level, I ask in my own house, in my own room, is my room beautiful? Is it a place I like walking into? Because I, beauty really is an important aspect of the world. God made us a beautiful world. So that's also something you could say. I want to tell you the best part of all these recommendations. Actually, I'm going to save that. <laughs> I'm going to save that. Um, here's a picture from the 1900s. We see them by the pond. That's still there. Children enjoying the children. Um, after During recess, they'd go and they'd play in the park. Another awesome thing, there is this workshop called Tooth Nayan Handmade Paper. And you, you can go with your family. It's great for all ages. And you could literally make paper from hand. And it's really fun and it's really, really beautiful going back, connecting back to beauty. Here's an example of something I, I bought the last time I was there. It was stationery. I love the stationery so much because I thought it was so pretty that anyone that I, I ran out of it, anyone that I wrote a letter to on that stationery, I would think this is only could be for someone super important to me because it's my favorite stationery and it really adds to it. So that's just something, even just looking around the store is really nice. That's also in Zechron Yaakov. Another thing, this is a complete, this is a different time period, a different story. So you probably have to go to Zechron Yaakov more than one day to keep the time period separate in your mind. There's this very, there's this very famous book, which if anyone went to Flatbush High School, maybe in other high schools they read it too. It's called Saragi Burak Nili, which I remember reading in school. 
And what it is, is there was this organization called Neely around World War I. It was the, it, Israel was ruled by the Ottoman Turks. And now you have World War I. And the people in Israel, the Jews, they hope that the British win because they don't want to be under the rules of the Turks anymore. Now, how, now how, could, now how could you have some more information? And Neely was this underground um, organization that what they would do is they would pass information on to the British about the Turks. Now, it's illegal to do this. It uh, has to be very secret and... So this is, my, this is later, this is around World War I. This organization started in 1915. The whole story I told you of the Olim, that was in 1882 to 1904. So this is a little bit later. And there was this house, and in the house was a family that they were part of Neely, and they would give secret information to the British. And there was a debate in the town. Do we let this happen? Do we not? What if the Turks find out? They're going to kill them. They're going to kill us. And the story has a very sad ending that one of the family members, her name was Sarah, she was caught and she was tortured and she eventually died. And you, this was the house that they lived in and you could go to the house and you hear the amazing story of bravery and dedication and loyalty. This in itself could be a whole um, expedition. I don't know that I'd recommend two museums in one day because it's probably a lot, but you could pick whichever museum you want to go to, also done in a really fun way and it's really, great story. Another thing which I didn't add because um, and if it's your type of thing totally do it but I guess the, the groups I'm usually with we don't normally do this. Um, there's a cemetery right at the entrance of Zechron Yaakov and the cemetery has all of these famous people that started the issue where that were part of kneeling in it. You could get a whole history lesson just from being there but if cemeteries are less of your thing then you'll just see from the outside and not go in, but I chose not to give details about it, but that is something which I think is, it, you have the, the city happening, all these places, and then the cemetery right there, so it kind of connects you back to the past and to the people that started it. Now, ah, I said I'm going to tell you the best part of all of this. This slide is the best part of all of this. This street is called the Rechav HaMeyastim, the street of the founders, and the people that lived in Zechron Yaakov, started out in huts, they lived on the street. And you see how it's wide because they were planning for the wagons, horses and buggies to be able to pass. Now, everything I just mentioned, the shul, the Bet Kidot, which is the first Aliyah Museum, the house of the Haronson family of Neely, the workshop, the Tishbi Winery is actually not on this block, but there's another amazing restaurant not on this block. All of this, oh, and the, and the garden, it's all the same block. So you don't even need a bus. And even if it's raining, you could run quickly from one store to the next. You could do all of this on one street. So how amazing you could have such a fun day being on one street, not to mention it's beautiful. It is just beautiful there. Plus, if you go online and you go to the town's website, they have a list of 20 things must-see sites. What I mentioned is only the tip of the iceberg because they have go see this historic fountain and go see this and go see that. And there's a ton, but I, I like giving a little bit rather than overwhelming with tons of information. So there is so much to see and it's just so pretty. We spoke about beauty. It is a pretty place to be. Now I wanna summarize and then I wanna leave you off with a question, what we spoke about today. So we started out with the exaggerated descriptions that the Jews of Romania who are leaving Romania, leaving hard lives there, leaving the pogroms, they're coming to Edith Israel and expecting to find a land where you bend down and there's honey and where the, the trees just drip fruit right into your hands. And that's not what they found. They found this rocky land that they couldn't plow and it was not what they expected at all. They were not prepared. They, they didn't have the farming skills and they were dying. They didn't have food. They were sick. And along comes the Baron Hirsch and he says, okay, I will help you either move back to Romania on me or move to Argentina. And I shared with you one of the wonderful responses that said, we will not leave. We are staying here. This is our land. We're going to live here and we're going to die here. And help is not far away because then along comes the Baron Rothschild and he gives them a tremendous amount of money. Now he came to Israel five times in his life and he, in total, the amount of institutions and communities that he supported, the amount of land that he bought, 30 different communities. Could you imagine that you could say that about yourself, that I supported, and because of me, this 30 full communities in Israel? 
really, really incredible what he did. Also, another fact I want to add, a lot of times um, the rich philanthropists choose, they, they don't have kids. It's very tragic. Um, Montefiore, who, uh, another story to talk about what he did, was also a rich philanthropist. Um, he didn't have kids and it's very sad, but the Baron Rothschild, he had kids, he had three kids. So I just like adding that in. He was rich and did all these great things and he also had kids. And one of the methods he said, okay, we want to help the Jews. So let me send educated officers from France. They know what they're doing. They can teach the Jews, but it a little bit backfired. It didn't, it didn't. It helped because they built vineyards and they helped them farm and taught them what to do. But the Jews are very resentful because they felt that these officers are looking down on them and they don't want people coming and telling them how to live their lives and what to do. Then we also spoke about the relationship that the Jews had with the Arabs. Zechron Yaakov was a model community and they had really great relationships with them. They learned how to get the, the grass and make food from it. Um, with the, the camels were able to help them. They spoke Arabic. Then we spoke about some attractions. What could you do? We're looking at in this picture, Rechob HaMeyastim, the Meyastim Street. On it, you could go to the shul. You can go to the beautiful garden, paper workshop. You can go to the first Aliyah Museum. And you can also go visit the Aronson House, which we added just a different historical time period, but it's also a fantastic story. Now, we opened with the question, what happens when reality is so far away from expectations. And this is another quote that was given when the, the Baron Hirsch's representative said, move to Argentina, move back to Romania. This was another um, response. It works much better in Hebrew because there's an understanding you need to have to understand this quote, so I'm gonna explain it. So it's Korbanot elu berit melech olam hem benenu ben aretuzeh, nechalatenu nechalat benenu lenetzach. So what the response is, these sacrifices, what sacrifices? The sacrifices that we're making, that our family is making, that our children are making, is a berit melach. Now, one of the, if you open up Sefer Vaikra, it says that every single korban needs to have salt on it. And it's this covenant between us and God that we're going to put salt on all, on all the korbanah. Oh, korbanah. And what the explanation here is the same way that you have this covenant of the salt that's how we're tied between Eretz Yisrael. This is our inheritance, the inheritance of our children. It's not something you just, let's go move away. We're tied eternally to this land. And it's something else which I really love. Another quote, this is from a woman. She says, the more obstacles there are, the sweeter the victory. The day will come and we will speak about all of our suffering with happiness and joy. And the day already came. Because if we think back to the pictures I showed you of Zechron Yaakov, it's a very happy street. It's beautiful. It's fun. There's workshops. There's museums. There's things to do. And if we go back and we, we asked, what do we do when reality is so far away from expectations? And I think the answer really is in the quote here, that when reality is so far away from expectations, take a step back and you put yourself in the bigger picture. Because the Jews then, they had really hard lives, but they stuck it through, or they did, but but they did, because they knew they were building something greater, and they were building something for the future, and it seems like the people here saying these quotes have a great sense of the bigger picture, and the future, and what they're investing in, and it's very hard right now in our local reality to see the bigger picture, but I think that's something that really helps us get out of the difficult times. And the question I want to leave you off with, which is my message that I get from Zechron Yaakov, is how do we see our life in terms of the bigger picture? And if I go and take a visit to Zechron Yaakov, being aware of the history, and you guys are too, I think of the Jews from Ali Arishona, that they came and they struggled and it was hard and they didn't get along with the officers. And their life is really hard. And then I say, but look today, look at the street. And then I ask myself in my own life, what is my life now? What are my challenges? What are my difficulties? But if I'm taking the stuff in the bigger picture, and I must say though, when you live in Israel, it helps because I could always say, okay, but I'm living in Israel, but I'm living in Israel and I'm being part of that bigger picture of Amis and Al. But even if you don't live in Israel, just being a member of the Jewish people is already part of the bigger picture because you're continuing the chain from Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov and you having Jewish children is continuing the train. So that in itself is enough. So that is what I get from Zechron Yaakov. I like thinking of the history, having a beautiful lunch, walking around. And it's 
it's a, a great Aliyah story. Not easy to move to Israel. It was not easy for them, but the rewards in the end, at least for the future generations, are amazing. Thank you so much for joining. I loved speaking with you, teaching you as always, and I am looking forward to next week. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.